So right now we have a, we got a short block. We need to turn this into a complete engine though, and there's still a lot to do. We gotta put the heads on it, get the valve train in it, get the intake on it. We may even, you know, jam the headers on this thing, a starter maybe, I don't know. We'll see how far we get. Um, but before we start doing that, I wanna just quickly show you this, tell you a few things that I did because I kind of blazed through this in last uh, week's video because it is eight cylinders and that means I did the same thing eight times over and over so I kind of went a little quick Shh, be quiet for a second I want you to hear this now as I turn this engine over by hand I want you to listen to the sound that it makes it's kind of a rough sound actually and that's on purpose the cross hatch the surface finish on these cylinder walls is pretty rough at the moment and it's done that way on purpose in order to make the piston rings actually seat to the to the cylinder walls or mate well so listen hear that sounds pretty rough and that's good that's what we want so i'll quickly tell you what i did in order to try to get the best chance for these piston rings to mate with these cylinder walls now things you usually like to mate but on occasion you'll get rings that don't like to mate with the cylinder walls and then you got an engine that burns oil forever and the only way to really fix that is to tear it down hone it out put a new set of rings in it and it's a ton of work so you really want your piston rings to seat right off the bat now i'm not saying the way that i did it is correct but this is the way that i did it so i'll explain i put very little oil on my piston rings just enough to you know to where they weren't dry wiped a drop or so of oil on the piston skirts and then took a, a rag put just a slight amount of oil on it just in damp really and wiped the cylinders that's all the oil that i want on these pistons and rings during the first few minutes of startup right it's going to get splashed on there later down the road but i want these rings to have the best chance of seating as possible so that's the way i done it and what little oil i did use on them is lucas break-in oil and its specific job is to you know for break-in so better seat that's all i got to say so the first thing that we're going to do get these cylinder heads cleaned up and jam those on the engine but before we do that i want to give you a quick look at them because i think they're probably the most interesting part of the entire engine in my opinion really nice pieces not the best quality but still nice you'll see head gaskets that we're going to be using now i know everything about these head gaskets i know how thick they'll be once these heads have been torqued down on them i know the volume in cc's that's left there and all that information is really critical when it comes to calculating your compression ratio if you're you know if you're building a performance engine you, that's something you want to know and this combination should give me a 10 to 1 compression ratio so let me show you these cylinder heads before we stick them on the engine so this is a very budget-minded set of aluminum cylinder heads made by Procom so not the best cylinder head you can buy but still these came with this engine when I bought it, and I'm curious to see how these things perform. I'm hoping in the future to upgrade to a little better set, but in case you haven't looked, cylinder heads are expensive. And uh, these aren't that bad, really. I've tore them down completely, looked them over really good, checked my valve stem to valve guide clearance, and they're actually spot on. So 341 thousandths is the diameter of our valve stem. That's a little over... Is it 8.5, somewhere right around there, millimeters? What I'm doing is checking my valve stem to valve guide clearance. Also checking the consistency of these valve guides. You can see their little bronze guides pressed in the head there. And that's exactly what they do, is guide the valve. They also transmit heat from the stem of the valve itself into the cylinder head. And I'm just using my gauge pins to go down through here, check the size of the hole in these guides and I've already went down through here once I've got the 342 negative uh, valve or gauge pin in here and it fits perfectly inside of each one of these I'll just go ahead and tell you that they are very consistent at least from one guide to the next got a really nice three angle valve job on these 7 16ths on our rocker studs, which is good, and guide plates installed. 202 intake, 1 6 exhaust, pretty standard there. And what else? 
the negative things that I can say about these cylinder heads is that the port work on them is pretty rough, pretty rough. And, you know, the cylinder or the uh, combustion chamber uh, design, probably not that great either. So there you go. That's the cylinder head that we're going to use. They don't get the best reviews, but from what I've seen, the majority of negative reviews on these have been secondhand. Like, I've got a buddy's cousin's uncle's friend who bought a set, and he said he didn't like them. Uh, very few first-hand negative reviews. So, since we have them, we're going to run them, at least for now. So I'm using a little bit of acetone here, just wiping down these maintenance surfaces, because I want my head gaskets to stick to these really well. So it's the next morning. I went and retorqued these heads, believe it or not, overnight. Those gaskets do compress a little bit, and not a bad idea, uh, I don't think, to go and hit them again, just to make sure that you are torqued to the proper value. This is a relatively high compression engine, and I'd hate to lose a head gasket just due to improper torque, maybe even after a couple heat cycles, you know, hit them again. So now it's time for the valve train. We need to put in our lifters, push rods, rocker arms, we need to set them to all to zero lash, and then we need to set our lifter preload. Also, I painted this thing. You probably didn't even notice, did you? That's why the ladies get angry at us, because we don't pay close enough attention. You can see I've polished the brass freeze plugs on this thing, and I thought that was a nice touch. It looks pretty good. I actually painted it silver. It's a smoke gray, really. Same color that my wheels on the truck are going to be. Uh, the Olive green that was on it, I liked that color, but it was kind of crappy paint, actually. So, wiped it down with acetone, got rid of that old paint, and painted it silver. So, let's put in the valve train, because that's a, I love doing that kind of stuff. So, lifters going in. I just got them soaking in some oil, not that they need to, just because. So here's all our valve train components, roller rockers, push rods, poly locks, put a little bit of the CMD extreme pressure lube on the ends of the uh, push rods here before we install them. Then take them and drop them in, make sure they're you know, sitting down in the pockets.
So now all we got to do is put on our roller rockers. Just going to slide them on, then we'll put our poly locks on. Got to make sure they're all sitting in their pockets. Now I've already checked this engine for proper valve train geometry. That's pretty critical. And uh, you can change the relationship of the push or the rocker arm to the valve by the length of the push rod. So you have to get the proper length push rods for whatever setup you're using. That way you don't cause excessive wear on your valve stems and guides. You want your rocker arm to be 90 degrees to your valve stem through the two trunnions, 90 degrees to the valve stem at 50% lift. Pretty, pretty critical. So I laid a straight edge across the tops of these valves and they're almost all right in line with each other, very close. So the geometry or the push rod length will be equal both on intake and exhaust, so no reason for me to, to check them all. But you can see I've got a really soft spring here. In fact, that's just a piece of stainless steel welding wire that I rolled up and made into a spring. And the reason why I put that on there is because it's soft, much softer than the spring inside of the hydraulic lifter, and collapses first and gives me a proper uh, representation of the travel. So what I have in here now for a push rod is a comps cam adjustable push rod that I have shortened by 50 thousandths. I've brought it to zero lash and I'm going to cycle this engine over and the tip of this roller rocker will rub what dry, will rub the dry erase marker off actually that I put on the tip of these valve stems and it's going to show me where this thing is traveling. I want it to travel as back and forth from one side of the center line of this valve to the other. That way it doesn't put stress, too much stress on one side or the other, right? So in a nutshell, valve train geometry is what I'm trying, proper valve train geometry is what I'm trying to figure out here. In fact, I'm just trying to make sure that these that were spec'd for the engine are correct. This is about as close to, close to an accurate representation as I'm gonna get. And that looks pretty good. I'm not looking at this little mark on the end here, just right in the center there. You know, these parts haven't made it together, but you can see it's traveling pretty much right across the center line from one side to the other. I'll take that. So now we're going to set this valve train to zero lash and we're going to preload these lifters. Now keep in mind these are hydraulic lifters. And I've done this several different ways, and this way that I'm going to show you is by far the easiest way that I've ever seen. And it's accurate. So let me show you super quick, and really it's hard to mess up doing it this way. So you can see that some of these lifters are pushed up. They're actually up on the lift of the valve, and you're supposed to adjust lifters all the way down on the bottom. Well, let me show you how to do this really quick, and we won't worry at all about where these lifters are on the cam lobe. So the first thing that I'm going to do is set all of these to zero lash. You can see they're, they're all just, just the nuts are just screwed on there. So we'll set them all to zero lash. It doesn't matter if they're up on lift or anything. We're just going to go down till we get no free play in these lifters. We don't want to compress the hydraulic lifter. None of these are pumped up. All we want to do is set these to zero. So I'm going to go through this entire engine and just set each one to zero, no matter where it's at, right? So we got them all to zero, or got the play out of all of them. Now I'm gonna rotate this engine 90 degrees, and I'm gonna do it again but I'm only going to adjust the ones that are loose. I'm going to leave the ones that are, you know, that are zero lash alone, or the ones that are even tight.
okay? And then I'm gonna turn it another 90 degrees and I'm gonna do this same process over and over again for two full rotations of this engine and then I'll be done. And I don't have to worry about keeping up with firing order or watching the valve train to see which piston's up on number one. Just two rotations, stopping every 90 degrees and taking the slop out of the loose ones. And you're done. So as far as adjusting these to zero lash, that's it. Two rotations, stopping every 90 degrees to only adjust the loose ones. And because we only adjusted the ones that were loose, we know we didn't put any preload in any of these. So by the time you get around two times, you know, stopping and adjusting the loose ones, you've had a chance to adjust each one of these at the base circle of the cam or, you know, under a no lift situation. So now adjusting preload is even easier than that. Because they're all at zero lash right now, even if some are you know, up on the you know, top of the cam, doesn't make any difference, we can just go down this engine, one bank or the other. We can put in half turn to do our lifter preload or three quarters of a turn, whichever you prefer. Doesn't matter if it starts opening a valve, whatever, doesn't make any difference. We just go down one side, half turn, three quarter of a turn, and lock them down and we're done. Our valves are set to zero lash and they're preloaded within a couple minutes. That's it, they are done. I like this Permatex form a gasket too. I use this stuff all the time. You can buy it in the can with a brush. You can also buy it like this in the tube. Just good to hold your gaskets in place and it acts as a sealer as well. But this stuff doesn't get hard. It just tacks up so you can come back later, clean up any bits that ooze out or you can stick your gasket to there, you know, go have lunch, whatever, come back and still, right? You're not in some big rush to put the gasket on or get the surface ma surfaces mated together. It'll just mush out of the way. It's never going to get completely hard. So here's a look at the intake that I decided to pick up, and I'm really excited about this thing. I think it's awesome. Now this is the Elderbrock Performer Air Gap, not the RPM Performer, just the Performer. They offer two intakes that look almost identical. One is tuned for the higher RPM performance, and then this one's tuned to have its best performance down low in the range that I'm probably gonna be using this thing. So I am super excited about this. And obviously the air gap, you can see underneath the runners here, there is a gap for air to run under there and keep the fuel charge that goes into the engine cooler. And supposedly, because of science, you know, that works. Not a bad idea, right? Because there is no pan, and I think in, in a lot of engines there's a, I think a valley pan, I think it's called, that shields the bottom of the intake from the hot oil. And these small blocks, the lifter valley is just open to the bottom of the intake and all that hot oil splashes up onto the bottom and transfers right into the intake, heating up your incoming air, 
which, right, not that good of a thing. So that's the intake we're going to use. Now let's uh, get ready and jam this thing on the engine. Ildebrock did a really nice job casting this intake, and you can see, made here in the USA, which is really nice, putting a little anti-seize on these uh, intake bolts. So online, there's plenty of diagrams of your torque pattern and specs, so you don't have to remember this stuff. Pretty easy to follow this stuff these days. So I got the intake on and all buttoned down. Now I can just dump in the break-in oil, which is Lucas straight 30 weight, and I'm going to pour it right down the distributor hole. So this is a five quart bottle and we have a five quart oil pan. So I can also ch check the accuracy of my dipstick once I get all this in. Should have picked a bigger funnel. So this thing's really coming together. I've got five quarts of break-in oil in this thing. I screwed on the Wix filter that I'm gonna be using, which is a 51061. Usually I run the tall version, which is the 51069. But I've mocked this thing up, and I know that with the headers that I'm using, I don't have clearance for the tall oil filters that I like. So we're using the shorter one. But anyway, now we can prime the oil system, and we'll do that with a drill using this fitting here down through the distributor hole. And all it does is kind of key in to the, to the oil pump. We'll also see what kind of oil pressure we can generate, evacuating all the air out of the system as well. We've got a 0 to 100 PSI gauge here that will screw into the back oil pressure NPT fitting, which is an eighth inch, and we will see what we can do. I'm excited for this part, actually. So let's see if we can't, uh, you know, make some oil pressure. So what I'd like to see is oil coming out of each one of these lifters. That means this bank, and just likewise with the other side, is all primed as far as the uh, lifters go. So I'm kind of surprised this thing has so much oil pressure. It's actually 80 PSI if this gauge is right. Yeah, we got oil coming out of, out of all of them on this side. Not an excessive amount, but it, it is. Yeah. I believe so. I think they're all oiling. Well, hello, Mr. Bob. Come here, Chloe. Chloe, come on. What are you barking at, girl? Hmm? What are you doing? Huh? What are you barking at? 
What are you barking at, girl? Ah, Mr. Bobs. What are you barking at? So I'm glad to see that this thing's oiling all the way up to the front. I'm a bit surprised to see that it has 80 PSI of oil pressure. I was expecting anywhere from maybe 45 to 50, maybe maybe 60 PSI. It does have a 58 a yellow melling spring, and I believe that's 58 PSI. So surprised to see 80, but it is what it is, I guess. Better a little more than too little. So oiling all the way to the front, which is good. And now I can put this thing together and be confident that at least I'm getting oil up to the top of the engine like I should. Good resistance on the oil pump. And there we go. Oh, what do we got here? A witty squirrel. Hello. Clover's growing quick. Is she doing okay? Mm -hmm. She's doing good. She's starting to play. I'm good. She'll think you know what to think about the dog. <coughs> yeah. And dogs, they don't know when to stop. So having excess oil pressure, it's better than having too low of oil pressure, but still not necessarily a really good thing. Anything more than what's required to keep the engine happy it really is just a parasitic load. Your engine's having to generate all that extra oil pressure that you know, you're not using, you're not benefiting from. In fact, it's costing you horsepower and it's costing you fuel economy just to drive an oil pump that's pushing a bunch of oil around that's not needed. And I think on a small block, at least what I was told, it's like seven to 10 PSI per thousand RPM is what is considered healthy. So, you know, it's good to have a little extra but you don't want way too much extra. When this thing gets hot, it'll probably go down to around you know, 50, I would guess. We'll see, we'll find out. I don't really know, to be honest. So I'm using the metal cord rubber intake gaskets. I forget where, I, I forget the brand, but they're just an off-brand um, gasket that I picked up off of that, uh, website named after the river in the jungle. They were pretty cheap, better than the cork ones. At least you can take these on and off. So we're just temporarily putting on these valve covers just to keep all the goo and stuff, just dust and dirt out of the engine. I've got to modify the other one slightly before I install it, or before I put it on permanently, that is. So I've got a couple items here that were sent in by viewers. Both of these items come off of my Amazon wish list, and I appreciate it. So thank you very much. Now this came some time ago. It's a aluminum adjustable alternator bracket, which is so much nicer than the original, and so much easier to adjust. I've used these before. Very nice from Greg Disrocher. Uh, I'm sorry for butchering your last name, Greg. He's from Rhode Island. So thank you very much. And then someone sent me a set of uh, spark plugs, and I appreciate it. There was no, no note or message with these. So if you sent me these, I appreciate it. So I'm going to gap these and uh, stick them in the engine, and we're also going to install the alternator because we can. So a little bit of blue molly on the threads. Just checking the gaps on these plugs. Making sure they ain't got damaged in shipping because they do get beat around quite a bit. Looks like they're gapped at least as best as I can tell at 29 thousandths. I'm just checking for consistency here. And they are good so far.
So that looks pretty good. And it works good as well. It'll be a lot easier to tension that alternator belt than, you know, a whole screwdriver and a wrench at the same time. So, kind of like that. So I'm just getting ready to stick this passenger side exhaust header on, and I've done something maybe a little different uh, to, in order to keep my exhaust manifold or header bolts from working loose, because that always seems to be a problem, and I've seen all sorts of different designs on header bolts to keep them tight. Now what I've decided to do is I modified the bolts that come with my headers. They're just little 3 8 16 thread, small head on them, 5 16 or 8 millimeters basically. What I did is I cross drilled right through the hole, or right through the head, and once I get these torqued down and tight, I'll use tie wire, same thing our military uses on our planes and stuff to keep their bolts from working loose. And hopefully, once I get these tight, due to the tie wire, they'll stay tight. So that's kind of the, the thought anyway. We'll see how it works in practice. Now what I've also done is put quite a bit of anti-seize inside the holes and on the bolts because of these dissimilar metals and a million heat cycles, they'll freeze on there. And if I ever take them off again, it'd be a good idea to have had some anti-seize on them. The problem with big headers like this is there's just no room for a big bolt head. So it makes them tough to get tight and stay tight. So these are Showfield headers. I like the way that they're made. Hopefully this engine will go in the truck with the headers on it or else I'll just be taking them back off. But we'll see. Probably will. I'd much rather put these on out here than under the hood of that truck. There we go. That's one. I'm no expert at this, but that should that should work. So progress was definitely made. I'm really happy with the way that this thing came together. I think it looks absolutely awesome, and it'll look even better once I'm situated with a fuel system, ignition, and get the wires on it, right? We got the heads on, we got the valve train on and adjusted, got the intake on, valve covers, all the front accessories. I even got the starter on this thing, which I didn't show. That was pretty involved, actually, to go through the entire, that's why I didn't show it, go through the entire setup according to the instructions to make sure that it works the way that it should. Two pages, but I did it. Got the headers on. And now that I've measured them across the back, I found that they're wider than the frame rails. So we'll see if they'll actually go in the truck. They're supposed to, but you know how headers go. If you've ever dealt with them, they're a nightmare to get on, not to leak and, you know, all fitted. So we'll see, you know, not a big deal to pull one of these off if I have to, but I was hoping not to have to. That's it, I guess. Thanks for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who's helped me out whatsoever, much appreciated. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, do that, please. I would appreciate it. It would be nice to see the channel grow. So that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. The birds fly south as the light leaves your eyes. Hold on to your dream.
to break through the storm.